William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. To ensure a longer life, folks, a gun in hand is worth two in the bush. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. There's a popular notion people have about confidential operatives. Stop any guy in the street and ask him. The notion? Steam-heated love, or, as the French say, amour. My classification of workers always got a blonde on one arm, another blonde in his lap, and a third blonde in his eye, so people think. The truth, as a matter of fact, is people are so right. Textbook biology aside, the true reason for our howling success with the ladies is our uh, fatherly appeal. It's women looking for the male protection they missed since the carefree days of the cradle. It's the unladylike search for the strong, dominating male who knows all the answers. It's also the classic feminine urge to pin horns on the masculine cranium. I won my horns by parking overtime outside Grand Central Station. I'd gone in to see if the mayor was making good on his promise to keep the trains running on time. I came out to find a summons tied to my windshield wiper. A green ticket. The $15 variety. Ouch. In my car, I found something more had been added to liven up my humdrum existence. A Cupid doll. Painted a rainbow pink with saucer eyes. And blowing so many scents over me, I got an immediate perfume jag. Uh, isn't there some mistake? No. You, uh, didn't mistake this for public hack? No. Then, uh, I'm in the wrong car? Are you? I'll check. Well, keys fit the ignition. The car belongs to me. Oh, how wonderful. But you don't. How sad. Funny. Funny? I always wonder just how the future Mrs. Barry Craig would happen along. Run into me turning a corner? Or come to me with a letter of introduction from my Uncle Hess in Allentown? You're disappointed it's like this. I'm frightened. Frightened? My uh, blood pressure. Ten more points and I'm flying with the angels. Oh, then you like me. We'll get married and have six kids. Seven. Seven's a lot of laundry. We'll live in the country. I'm allergic to marigolds. A picture wall looking out on green fields. Comes August, I sneeze and my eyes get red. We'll name the children Tommy. Not all six of them. Seven. Oh, I did want one daughter. What will I call you when I'm hunting high and low for my cufflinks? Cerise. And when I want help with the supper dishes? Barry. And when we toast marshmallows and reminisce about how we first came to meet, uh, what should I remember? How I hid in your car to escape the dragon. The dragon? A repulsive little man who follows me. Where did he follow you from last? Connecticut. He was on the train. From Connecticut to my car? Yes. I see. Where is Mr. Repulsive right now? Behind us. Behind us? In the gray coupe. He's waiting to follow us when you pull away. I'll fix that. Oh, no. I'm Samson. I break heads like matchsticks. Please, no. No violence. Nothing to spoil the fun we're having. Oh, I feel so good. Oh, I haven't felt good for such a long time. So what do I do? Just take me away. With a chaperone on our tail? You're capable and clever. Huh. I shake guys like salt out of a shaker. I knew you were equal to the dragon. For every block he hangs on over ten, you can paint a zebra stripe on me. In no time, I had more zebra stripes than skin. The repulsive dragon hung on for ten blocks, then thirty more, then through the Holland Tunnel, way into Jersey. I hung up a new highway speed record, but the great coupe stayed in the money. 
Your dragon drives like he was born to the wheel. But you're so much better. All of a sudden, baby, I'm not so sure. I got off the highway, snaked up and down deserted side roads. I followed the moon across rocks and stumps of forest like my car was a jeep, but the gray coupe hung on. Hung on close enough to point up the risks in my undertaking. <laughs> the dragon's spitting fire at us, baby. He's shooting at your tires. Oh, you're wrong about the tires. Oh, Barry, you've been hit. How are you going to like me with a dimpled elbow? In front of him like this, we're a nice, lush target. Well, you're not stopping. I've run out of road. Dead end ahead. Oh, we can't. We... Barry, look. He's crashed. Yeah, he has. That will teach him to shoot and drive at the same time. He ran into a tree. Remind me to kiss the tree. Let's go off for our condolences. Uh-huh. Wait. Huh? I almost forgot. Uh, got a dime handy? A dime? Oh, yes. I- here. But why? I'm throwing it to Finnegan. For luck. It was Finnegan who made the gray coupe crash in the nick of time. Oh. You uh, understand? Yes. Yeah. Finnegan's your good angel. Oh, I almost forgot, too. Let me see. Mm. A quarter. I'm throwing it to Mrs. Rumpelheimer, my good angel. You're growing on me, baby. No question about it. You're really growing on me. The great coupe was telescoped like an accordion. Getting the unconscious dragon out of the wreck was like breaking into a sardine can with your fingernails. An owl kept applauding the show. A vest pocket dragon, small hands and dainty feet, and the emaciated look of a guy who went hungry Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. How badly hurt is he? He could be worse. He could be dead. Contusions. When he comes to, he's going to hate that word. Your elbow. Only a nick that can wait. Buster here is really emergency. I've got to get him to a hospital. But... If he keeps bleeding, the dragon will change to a zombie right in front of us. Contusions weren't half the medical jargon. The patient's in an oxygen tent, Mr. Craig. What's the diagnosis? Multiple injuries to the head. Conditional paralysis of the reflexes due to severe concussion. Oh, he'll recover? Pathologically, yes. What does that mean? As an aftermath of trauma, there may be psychiatric complications. Meaning? A memory lapse, an amnesia. Rough. Oh, maybe not. Maybe it's a blessing. Maybe Buster has more he'd like to forget than remember. His name appears to be Reuben Clark? Yeah. That's the name on the label sewed inside his coat. But no other identification, address, the nearest of kin? No. As I've already said, I looked for a wallet. Oddly enough, he wasn't carrying one. Mm. The hospital will need more information for a police report. I've uh, told you all I know. I was out driving with my girl and heard this crash behind me. The gray coupe, out of control, had folded against a tree. I played Good Samaritan. That's all there is. He's in your hands now, Doc, so give him the full treatment, huh? Get a perfume jag on and your brain takes to the hills. It happens to a bachelor pushing 40. That weak moment when single bliss suddenly has the feeling of solitary confinement. Oh, you were wonderful rescuing me. The Congressional Medal goes to that tree. Do what you did for me in blind faith. All through history, men have gone blind and boneheaded over a Cupid doll. Mark Anthony, for instance. Oh. Ooh, baby. You kiss like you took a graduate course. No man has ever risked himself for me before. The men in your past must have been 80 and over. I've never before had a champion. Tie a blue ribbon around my neck and uh, fit the dunce cap at a rakish angle. The dunce cap? Blind faith, you said. I could be promoting a horse laugh at myself. Oh, no. Then fill in a few reassuring facts. Uh, facts? The delirious dragon I palmed off in a hospital. Reuben Clark, who is he? I'm not sure. Who do you think he is? I think a, a man in the hire of my guardian. And what's the problem with your guardian? I... 
I don't think I want to talk about it. It's too late for reluctance, baby. I've taken too big a bite of your life. He's mistreated me, hurt me, kept me prisoner, confined me to my room, always under watch. Why? He wants to marry me. There was money, many, many valuable things left to both of us when my parents died. And Guardian wants all of it through marriage to you? Yes. Hmm. But why run? Why not stand up to him, get to a lawyer, go to the police? I can't. He's clever, my guardian. Devilishly clever and determined. You're in the land of the free. We pay judges to step on worms. He threatened to have me put away if I oppose him, if I keep refusing to marry him. What do you mean, put away? In a sanitarium. He's bribed people, old servants, even old friends to swear that I'm mentally irresponsible. <laughs> nice guy, your guardian. Well, I have no way of fighting him, fairly. You've got me. Oh, thank you so much, but I... I don't want to fight him. Procrastination, baby. I just want to hide and rest. Not think today and tomorrow. Just just not think. I've been trapped in a nightmare, in a, in a hideous nightmare. Sure, sure you have. It's up to your ears. You want to breathe. Uh, nothing to fret over. Just pass the time. Hmm. And have fun. Like the fun we were having. Six kids. Seven. During this breather... Where do you want to be? Anywhere. Where only you can find me. Okay. I know a country shack owned by a friend of mine over at Scotch Plains. Oh. It won't be in use until May 1st. And I know where the key is. Oh, you're wonderful. You'll be the guest of a certain Lieutenant Trav Rogers, only he won't know it. It's Rogers' shack. Oh. I'll stock you up with groceries and look in now and then. I'll take you over to it. Just one more fact to file away. Who and where is your guardian? I'd rather not at present. No, oh, you can trust me. My word on it. I won't make a move until you agree to it. My guardian is Jeffrey Foley. We live in Tuxedo Grove Heights, Connecticut. <laughs> Back in my office, I got my first real indication that boy-girl woo-hoo sometimes echoes back, ow wow. An uninvited caller. Male, 30 about, a flashy dresser and a peppermint striped shirt, gray suede gloves, and a nickel-plated revolver. You Barry Craig? Uh, no. What do you mean, no? This is Craig's office? Was. Uh, I took over this morning. I'm a distant cousin. Then where's Craig? Passed away. Crook? Yeah, all of a sudden at uh, 2 a.m. this morning. What are you giving me? The obituary. Into your pocket and throw your wallet on the desk. I want to check. It uh, so happens I'm uh, uh, carrying Craig's wallet to turn it over to the estate. Where's your dame? Dame? You're asking for something, Craig. Your arm will get stiff pointing that gun. I got a heat lamp home. Oh. You don't want to talk about the dame, huh? I've got a block against discussing women. I was a retarded adolescent. Want to talk about the track? The dame. Famous battles of history, then. The dame. You're a hard man to please. Get over to the window. The window? Open it. You can't throw guys out of windows. Why not? The sanitation code. Littering the sidewalk. You'll be socked five bucks in magistrate's court. Open the window, comedian. Now, close it. Close it? Just what did that accomplish? You're smart. Figure it out yourself. I just did. Who was I signaling? The big guy. He'll be up to talk to you. Later. Later? After I've softened you up. So you can talk politely to the big guy. He don't like wise-cracking comedians. Now lie down on the floor. What for? So I can get at your head. Standing up, I can't reach you. You are kind of short for a muscle man. Yeah, bending over the dice all the time I was a kid. Grew down and stood up. So lie down, Craig. Nice, huh? You can close the safety catch on your gun. I'll lie down nice. Now tell me a funny story. While I work. <laughs> in a fog, <clears throat> a cigar fog, clouds of strong tobacco blowing in my face. 
I found a face behind the cigar after a while. A moon face with a contented smile. Like men smile after dealing themselves a royal flush in spades. <laughs> hey, keep that stinkweed in my face and I'll be gassed to death. It's fine Cuban tobacco. But I'm no Cuban. Let's talk, Craig. Let's talk about the beating I survived. My deepest apologies. The dude is a continual embarrassment to me. The dude, huh? I've tried to teach him moderation and restraint. Turn him over to my teaching for ten minutes. All right, I will. Joke. I don't know where I fit into your game. I'll tell you. Automobile license number BC-100, New York. Honorary plates issued to Barry Craig. So? Your automobile. I saw a certain young lady get into it yesterday. It pulled away, unfortunately, before I could formulate strategy. In pursuit, I lost the car in traffic. So? This morning, I identified you as the owner of the car. Where's the girl, Craig? I don't know. She thanked me for the lift and got off at Battery Place. I don't think so. You'll have to take my word on it. Temporarily, perhaps. I'm fairly resourceful at proving liars to be liars. The dude's arm-weary right now. I'm also a vindictive man when lied to. My one great failing. Who hasn't got one flaw in his character? You're uh, a practical man, Craig. Is that a cash bribe developing? A modest gesture of goodwill. $1,000? Keep your money in your pocket. You're not tempted? Only curious. What makes the girl worth a grand on the hoof? That doesn't concern you. It had better not concern you. You're a fool, Craig. Lockenvar riding for a fall. Who's Lockenvar? You're championing a girl you know nothing about. Whatever she told you, Craig, you can be sure it's pure invention. I'm only sure you're after her, and you ring counterfeit. Craig, I warn you. And that stooge in a peppermint shirt you use for a calling card. You don't really think you can whistle me over to your side? All right. Hide the girl, play the hero, and the idiot. There's a keg of dynamite under you, Craig. Oh, if only you could free your eyes of stardust. Keg of dynamite. The phrase kept repeating in my head until it gave me the willy. How much of the truth had Cupid told me, I began to wonder. Information? Will you get me the phone number of a Jeffrey Foley, Tuxedo Grove Heights, Connecticut? Later in the afternoon, I went calling on love. Lock and bars here, baby. Very. With a sack full of groceries. Wax beans, salmon, fresh blueberries. Vintage year bagels, enough food to keep you hiding out for a month. Here, I'll take your coat. Take my hat first, huh? The dunce cap. The dunce cap? I hate myself in it. Take it off me, baby. Barry, what's happened? I tried to telephone that wicked old guardian of yours. You tried to? Jeffrey Foley of Tuxedo Grove Heights, Connecticut. There's no Tuxedo Grove Heights anywhere on the map of Connecticut. I, I lied. Tell me something I don't know. But only about the address. What's the real address? Uh, Cranberry Hills, Pennsylvania. Why'd you lie about the address? I... I wasn't sure I could trust you. Really trust you. Baby, come here. I've confided in people only to have them use me. Extort money. Hurt me. Two guys dropped in on me today looking for you. They barely stopped short of murder. I came out here by way of Planet X to shake them. You must be quite a prize to rate two homicidal retrievers like my morning callers. One million dollars, Barry. The estate my guardian is trying to steal. It's worth one million dollars. A million dollars? I knew that love, when it came, would be nothing trivial, but I never dreamed it would have a Dun and Bradstreet rating. <laughs> perfumed doll cries on your shoulder, and reality drowns in a tub of tears. Cupid knew her way to my heart. 
like there was a neon sign on my chest saying, Enter here. When love let go of my throat long enough, I took a half-hearted whack at confidential investigating. I did some more sneak checking on Cupid. The repulsive dragon, Reuben Clark. I wanted his version of events. The patient has shown extraordinary improvement, Mr. Craig. Is he conscious, Doc? Yes. I want to talk to him. I don't think... Don't think. The first story I told you, I thinned it down a little. The fact is this. Well, police badge. Uh-huh. But, uh... Don't pump me, Doc. I'm engaged in Operation Top Secret. I can't give out facts until I've wrapped up the case. Of course. Which door do we go through? The dragon talked like a guy kicking himself around the block. I first saw the girl on the train. Cerise Foley. I never knew her name. Oh, no. Look, let me tell it my own way. All right, tell it. Well, it was in the club car. She sat across the aisle from me, looking peculiar. Looking peculiar? A little loony, humming little ditties, then winking over to me, then laughing to herself. Are we talking about the same girl? Look, I'm talking about the chick you made me chase all over Jersey. Keep talking. Well, the way it was, I figured an easy pickup. You're trying awfully hard for a bust on the snooze. You asked me to tell you, and I'm telling you. Okay, tell me. Well, I'm a guy like any other guy. Good looker like this chick wants to be sociable, so I... Stop embroidering it, Buster. So what'd you do, marry her or something? You took the seat beside her. Then what? Well, we got to talking, getting acquainted. I told her how I was a hardware salesman fresh in from Binghamton. I don't want to know your pedigree. Well, she told me she was princess something or other, traveling incog... What word am I muffin? Incognito. Yeah, incognito. Well, her uncle was a Maharaja somewhere, and she was here on a secret mission for him. To raise cash, she said. The Maharaja was stone broke. You're making this up. Well, I thought she was until I got a peek into that overnight bag she kept on her lap. What was in the bag? Jewels. The stuff the Maharaja sent her here to sell off. Jewels, mister. Enough jewels to make you go clean off your rocket. Like you went. Yeah, like I went. Cupy confirmed the fact of the jewels. Yes, Barry. I have jewels. Many, many jewels. Bracelets, brooches, rings. Oh, right here in my overnight bag. See? They're real? Well, yes, of course. Where did you get them? Uh, I asked, where did you get them? You're hurting me, Barry. No phony stories about a guardian or a Maharaja. I want the truth. I, I stole them. Who from? Jeffrey Foley. Of Cranberry Hills, Pennsylvania? No. Oh, he really lives in Meadow Farms, New York. I worked for Mr. Foley as an upstairs girl. You were Foley's maid? Yes. He was a brute. And Mrs. Foley, too. They mistreated me, humiliated me. So you made off with a fortune in jewels? Yes. Baby, put your hands out nice and straight. Put my hands out? I'm handcuffing you and tying you up so you stay put in my absence. Where are you going? Away from that sweet, sappy, daffy kisser of yours. So I can think. Grand larceny, baby. With yours truly, accessory after the fact. I thought it over, stewed over it, and wound up telling it to Lieutenant Trav Rogers. So love finally came to Barry Craig. If you have to rub it in. What brand of smokes do you want sent to the state pen? Give me an out. An out like? A deal, uh, quietly arranged. This Foley gets his jewels back and he doesn't prosecute. Where's the girl in the swag now? When I tell you, uh, don't blow a fuse. What's that supposed to mean? Your shack up in Scotch Plains, where you uh, uh, cool off uh, July and August. What about my shack? The girl's been hiding out there. Uh, she's there now. Craig, of all the crust. Oh, I didn't think you'd mind. You didn't think I'd mind a common thief and a moonstruck admirer and an accomplice. Now, Craig, you're under arrest, and so is your Cupid doll. The minute I arrive in Scotch Plains. But it didn't end like that. 
As it turned out, after some nice police handling, I had a couple of new wallops, a couple of new surprises in store. The first surprise was handed me by a solemn-faced fellow wearing a white coat and a white beard, a doctor. I'd been brought to a place called Hopewell Rest, a sanitarium, by Trav Rogers. This is Dr. Kempner, a psychiatrist. Doctor, tell it to Craig. Uh, Yes. Uh, Mr. Craig, I'm acquainted with all the details of your curious experience with Cerise Foley, the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Jeffrey Foley. Daughter? Now, wait a minute, Doctor. Uh, Craig, hear the doctor out. Okay. The story of the jewels and her position as a maid were a pure fabrication, part of, shall I say, her newest hallucination. Newest hallucination? The young lady has been a mental patient under my care here for some time. She hallucinates many, many things. The jewels belong to her father. She merely appropriated them in this latest escapade. Two guys who worked over me. Who were they? I'll answer that. They were private detectives hired by the father to recover the jewels and his daughter without publicity. They play rough for private detectives. <laughs> Their promised fee was $25,000. The fee had them a little overeager. Uh, Cerise, uh, she's here now uh, in this sanitarium? Uh, yes. Uh, she is confined here. Can I see her? number two added some gray hairs to the few I already had. I watched the doctor walk Cupid doll toward me. Hello, baby. The doc tells me you'll do okay, and uh, I'm rooting for you. Who is this man, doctor? I watched her stare at me blankly, stare through me, then walk away. You... See, Mr. Craig. She looked right through me, as if she didn't know me. She does not know you. That is another symptom in her uh, hallucinations. An element of amnesia, shall we say. She forgets the escapade and her companion in it totally. You mean she'll never remember me? Never know me? I mean, you must forget her. You are her good friend. For a day. And now, it is another day. You'll get over her, Craig. It'll hurt a while, but you'll get over her. Yeah, I'll get over her. <laughs> that crack you made, Trav, what was it again? Oh, yeah. Love comes to Barry Craig. Good night, folks. See you next week. You'll be listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, A Time to Kill, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story titled Motive for Murder, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, death flies the Atlantic from Lisbon to New York, A corpse breaks the bank for $40 million, and yours truly almost sprouts wings. See you next week, folks. Featured in the role of Cerise was Arlene Blackburn. Barry Craig, starring William Gargan, was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is Don Pardo speaking. Next, Robert Montgomery presents something different in news analysis on NBC.